Hello, this is Angela with Parkrose Permaculture. We are standing in the backyard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden. It's the first day of July. Now, we've had this big heat wave and it has sort of passed. And last night we had rain, which was really exciting, not only for me, but for the wildlife and for my bees and my ducks and my chickens. And I thought, you know, since the rain has come back, uh, for however long we've got it, this is a great time for me to make a video on a subject that I promised y'all ages ago and I've just been too busy to get around to it. And that is the design, implementation, efficacy, and plant choice of my rain garden. Now in permaculture, we talk about zones when we're designing, zone zero being your house and working up to zone five, the farthest from your property, and that is complete wilderness. And often when we design, we think about the things right out our back door, and we are standing right now, right out my back door. We talk about the uh, area right out our back door as being zone one, or maybe zone two but things right up close to the house. And usually we put things there that we visit every day and use every day, including maybe your strawberry patch, your herb garden, um, annual veggies that you need to check on daily, something that you walk by frequently. So it may seem odd that I have chosen to put my rain garden directly out my back door. So I wanna talk about my design process here and how the rain garden benefits me as a homeowner, benefits my garden here, and um, also what plants I have chosen and some things I would think about tweaking in the future. Or if I were to redo this project, things I would do differently. So hang tight with me and I'll show you what's going on here in my rain garden in my zone one right out my back door. Alrighty, here's my back door, dinner bell, back door, in process bike shed, pan around right here, you see in my kindling rack, kids bikes, and boom, rain garden. Now normally folks might think about putting an outdoor seating area here, uh, maybe your fire pit, maybe your strawberry patch, maybe um, an herb garden. But instead, I have put my rain garden here. And that may seem like it's contrary to a lot of permaculture design, but I wanna show you why this garden needs to be right here. Now, first of all, let me just say we've come out of a terrible heat wave, so parts of my rain garden are looking a little bit stressed and a little bit sad. And just know that um, normally things are looking a little bit more vibrant than they are right now. Okay, so looking at the back of my house, you can see the upstairs of my 1922 cottage, and there's all of this rainwater collection off of the roof. Then we have a pergola that we put in several years ago and had improved, um, during the pandemic and this also has a tremendous amount of rainwater capture it's so much that in the nine months of rain we get here per year it doesn't make sense to do rain barrels it would overwhelm them right off the bat again mind the mess building a bike shed it's in process this is an area we use heavily because it's cool and faces north and also in the rainy months is protected from the rain i don't have a garage so this becomes my workstation and it becomes a catch-all place for kids toys and bikes etc so we have rainwater catchment off the roof here it falls straight down there are no gutters and I'll show you in a second, there is a buried channel of gravel on either side that comes and meets at a low point right there. So you can see here, buried channel of gravel, it is sloped. After it meets at the low point here from either side, the water continues to slowly filter downhill. This area right here is a trench three feet deep. I dug it out and used the dirt from this to mound up on either side and build these mounds of the rain garden. No extra dirt was brought in for this project and I spent about $65 on gravel. So as we walk downhill here slowly through the rain catchment system, water is slowly filtering downhill. Now it's hard to see because these iris and blue-eyed grass have kind of taken over. There's more gravel under here Gravel, 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 stepping over the plants, more gravel, and we get to the end here and then there is a buried channel of gravel that slopes downhill 
and takes you right to my first swale of my annual veggie bed. And should this overflow, there is more gravel going downhill here and it will take you to this swale. And then my veggie beds form a gentle downhill slope. Should these each overflow, they flow around the edge here and into the next kidney bean shaped bed. So that way I am taking the excessive amounts of rainwater that we have, and I'm taking it and slowly sending it down into the garden through the rain garden and a system of swales. And in that way, I have far more water catchment and storage than I would ever get out of a series of rain barrels. And I don't have to put in a large cistern. The rain garden itself acts like a giant rain barrel in the ground. So it may seem odd to have this right at my back door instead of those other typical zone one um, fixtures in a permaculture garden. But for me, this works perfectly. I love the view. I love sitting here on a rainy day or a hot sunny day and enjoying the view of my rain garden full of pollinators and it's functional. It serves as a highway, as a transit system for all of this rainwater catchment straight out to my veggie beds. It also helps because this area here is not actually very sunny. It's a little too shady to grow annual veggies here. And so in this part of the rain garden, I have plants that can tolerate a little bit more shade. So this wasn't ideal for a straight north facing veggie patch. That wasn't gonna work, but it works great for a rain garden. And then as we move farther out into the sun trap, there's the place for my hot sun loving annual veggies to grow and water delivered straight to them. So this project took me about two weeks to install. All of the large rocks you see here were dug out of this trench. My yard is full of glacial and alluvial backfill. Lots and lots and lots of big, big rocks. So I didn't have to buy any. Again, I bought about $65 worth of gravel for this project. Um, it also included putting gravel all up in this area here. It was quite a bit of work. I did it during rainy weather and it was really fun. We had a giant mud puddle and my kids would play in it. Um, and then once it's been filled in, it's worked really, really well. The water moves slow enough, the slope is gradual enough that I don't lose much in the way of mulch out of the beds and it doesn't get muddy and I don't get too much shifting of the gravel going downhill. Let's stop and look at this bumble. So in the garden, I have a huge array of plants suited for the different microclimates that a rain garden creates. Now I do have stepping stones all the way through across the path and up the other side. It's hard to see them because, well, for one, my Veronica has gotten really floppy because I neglected to Chelsea chop it this year. And when the soil is a little bit too fertile for some sun loving plants, they can get uh, tall and floppy. You can see some of my native strawberries got a tiny bit of sunburn, but I use them as low growing ground cover all through here, as well as white clover. This is done blooming for the year, but I have master wart everywhere in the garden. It does very, very well as an early flowering bee food in a rain garden, kind of freely moves about where it will. So when planting in your rain garden, it's really important to consider the microclimates you have created in this situation. So as I've said before, think about first how much sun your rain garden is going to get. For me, this back corner here, where you see this giant anise hyssop, which is a bumblebee magnet, that gets less than eight hours of sun a day, probably more like four. And so I grow things that can tolerate a little bit more shade. I have columbine there, I have master wart, I have my anise hyssop. On the other side in the back here, I have a rhubarb because that was growing there way before this was a rain garden. It's a super happy rhubarb and I couldn't bring myself to tear it out to put in other plants. So I left her there. She does take up a big chunk of the rain garden. Very, very happy. The big deep roots that are produced by a rhubarb love the extra water here. So you have your main channel through which the water travels, right? And then you have two main microclimates that you create. There's the inside edge of the berm 
And after you mound up the soil, there is the back edge or outside edge of the berm. Those are two very different sets of growing conditions. For me, I have found along the inside here, the things that do really well are plants that can handle high water for the nine months of the year we get rain. They can handle having what's called wet feet. That means I use our native blue-eyed grass. I use sedges that I bury in one gallon buckets so that they don't escape and take over. I also deadhead them religiously so they don't self-sow and make babies everywhere. Japanese iris work very well and yellow-eyed grass as well are all growing in here. I got most of the plants for the inside of my rain garden at Zira Plant Nursery in Portland and I will link to them below. They don't sponsor this channel, but I think they're an excellent nursery. Now along the outside edge, of the rain garden. Here, you need to plan for low water loving plants. In my garden, this area is full sun, so I wanna pick sun loving, low water plants. I am planting for pollinators and also to hold the soil in and prevent erosion. So the things I have chosen include Zagreb coreopsis, which is right here, Echinacea. I have asters of all kinds, including my aster munch, which is my favorite aster, which is just, just beginning to bloom in the last two days. Native bees go nuts over it. I have some native asters as well, and I have some other um, Michaelmas daisies, which are asters that are brand new this year and should be blooming hopefully in a month. I also want to plant things like blue false indigo as a nitrogen fixer in this area to help feed and nourish the other plants around it with a little boost of nitrogen. Because this area has a lot of water washing through it, I do find that if you um, plant some leguminous plants to help fix a little bit of extra nitrogen that may have been washed out, that is a good thing. So I have three blue false indigo in this garden. They are cut back now because they've done flowering and are just sending up new green growth. Now the annuals that I have growing in this area are borage and nigella, which freely self sow Nigella is also called love in a mist. I let them come up wherever they want and they tend to come up directly in the gravel and then I just yank them and feed the borage, especially to the ducks and chickens. My ground cover native strawberries tend to walk into the gravel and I pull them up about twice a year. I could let them completely subsume the gravel, that would be okay, nothing wrong with that, but I do like to be able to see the gravel most of the way down. I really love the juxtaposition of the airy bobby sanguisorba with the rigid, more angular echinacea here in this part of the garden. Sanguisorba is such an underutilized garden flower in my opinion, especially here in North America. So what would I change if I had to do this garden over again? Not very many things, actually. I love the fact that this was a cheap project. By the way, if you are in Portland, Oregon and you install a rain garden, you get a credit on your water and sewer bill. So it actually makes a little bit of money for you. So the $65 output for the gravel, and I probably spent maybe $40 on plants, and then the rest are cuttings I took from elsewhere or divisions I got from friends or sourced on Craigslist. So I spent very little on the plants themselves. Now, I would have moved this rhubarb. It feels out of scale with the other plants in the rain garden. It just feels too large. I like to pretend that it is maybe my own little homage to a gunnera since I don't have room to grow one of them in my garden and I wish I did. Uh, such a ridiculously amazing plant. Um, so sometimes I like to pretend that that's my little fairy size gunnera, but um, it's really too big for this space, especially in scale with all of the other plants here. Thinking about scale is really important. Plants that you put in your rain garden take up more space than you realize, and you need to think about whether they're going to encroach upon the path or the gravel on either end and how you feel about that. Some other plants that didn't do well, I had a honeyberry in here originally, got way too big, I took it out and gave it to a friend. I have a germander in here, while well, the bees love it and the foliage is incredibly resistant to sunburn and it's just a hardy plant you can abuse the heck out of. The dogs can pee on it and it doesn't get damaged. Um, it's also a little too big and it has smothered a few other plants. So I either need to be more diligent about pruning it back or I need to remove it and put in something a little bit smaller.
A few notes on maintenance. You do have to divide your Japanese iris every few years or they get too big and they get kind of dead in the middle. But that's a great opportunity to share them with your friends. Same for the sedges that I plant in buckets in the rain garden. You have to dig them up and divide them every once in a while or they get kind of strangled in the pot. But you really don't want to put um, aggressive water loving plants loose in the gravel of your rain garden because within a few years they will dominate your other plantings. Definitely think about planting a cascade, a sequential planting of blooms for pollinators. This is one of the best parts of your garden to sit out back and enjoy hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, dragonflies, you name it. They all love the rain garden, but you want to plant so that you've got blooms all year long for wildlife in order to draw them in. So not only do I plant for early blooming things like masterwort and some early miniature roses, I have late blooming things like echinacea and aster, which will keep this garden going and attracting pollinators all the way into October. So thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this video today. I hope you learned a little bit about rain garden design. Hope that inspires you to consider whether your property is the right place to install a rain garden in order to reduce your sewer and water bill, have better rainwater capture on your property, more efficiently store and move water to places in your garden that need it, improve drainage in places that used to have standing water. Also to bring in the pollinators and increase your enjoyment in your garden. So if you got something out of this video, please give it a like. Please consider subscribing. Check out my Patreon in the description and I'll be back soon. Thanks.